Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's been a long day. I was at TWC today, and, and in an NGO, you really don't know what can happen. So uh, you just ride with, with, with whatever turns up at the, at the doorway, and then it's a roller coaster. Uh, something like 15 workers came to lodge a complaint, so we had to deal with it. Um, right. Uh, let me start by just uh, talking a bit about TWC2, the work we do, and how is it related to to the issues that we are, talk, we are here to, to discuss today. The TWC2 remit, our main mission, is to help workers with their employment-related problems. Uh, largely problems when they come here and they run into a, a lousy employer, um, a, 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 rogue, uh, um, a, a rogue agent, get injured, nobody wants to pay for the medical treatment and so on, and we step in and, and try to resolve it for them. We usually don't uh, deal with law and order issues pertaining to uh, foreign workers. Uh, if they are out there, they commit a crime or they get in some dispute with another person, that doesn't come into our, our, our remit. So basically, what happened in Little India on sun, two Sundays ago, uh, TWC2 wasn't there. Uh, from what we could see, none of the workers who have been locked by us as people we are helping while we are involved in it. So basically we are also looking at it as bystanders, learning as much as we can. Uh, therefore, I really have no more knowledge of that event than every one of you out sit here today. Uh, I'm, reading, I'm reading what's on, on social media. I'm waiting for the police as they investigate to come up with more facts. I'm waiting for the court case. I'm also waiting for the COI to do a proper job and tell us what they have found in that investigation. Um, and um, it also therefore is my hope that uh, the COI, uh, Commission of Inquiry, Inquiry uh, will take this opportunity to take a more holistic approach to this whole issue of workers uh, writing in India uh, and not just treat it as a purely a law and order issue of ascribing blame and so on, that we should take this opportunity to look at, uh, in Singapore, how is our working environment and living conditions for a foreign worker? And uh, what is it in there that may cause uh, a tendency to lead to events that we saw two Sundays ago? And therefore, in understanding these things better, uh, we can address these issues and therefore prevent a repetition of it. I think nobody wants to see that kind of thing happening again. Basically, my, my, my message is that we should really learn the right lessons from what happened, uh, quite independent and separately from how the courts are going to rule uh, in, the, in the days or the weeks to come. Uh, tonight's talk, I'm going to cover uh, my topic in two broad areas. One would be the workers we are helping who come to us for assistance. And this would be people who have got a, a dispute that they need to resolve. That means a worker with a problem that they need help. And then beyond that, let's deal with the larger issue of just at the average foreign worker we see who really has got a problem, who is going about his business day to day, uh, what sort of living conditions does he put up with? Okay, so these are, these are the two broad areas I want to cover. On the first part, which is about workers with a problem, TWC2 TWC has quite a lot of experience now. I mean, uh, on the average, in the past three years, we've locked about more than 2,000 cases a year of workers with problems. Uh, I should also uh, add that uh, tonight, when I talk about workers' problems, I just want to focus on the problems faced by South Asian male workers. Because foreign workers is a broad spectrum, there are also foreign domestic workers and so on. But for tonight's conversation uh, issue, let's just deal with the problems faced by South Asian male workers on a work permit, therefore low wage manual work. Uh, next. Uh, um, The best way to, to look at uh, these male workers who come here and who then, who then come to us for assistance would be, yeah, uh, what, what is that journey, the first step of that journey that takes them to Singapore, which then potentially cause them a problem. Um, any foreign worker wanting to come to Singapore, 
uh, if he's allowed to land in Singapore, he needs something called an IPA, in principle approval, that he has got employment here. And um, the idea of an IPA also is that um, on that IPA, which is issued by the Ministry of Manpower, would be written uh, his, the salary he's meant to get in Singapore, the name of his employer, uh, and this would be both in the English language and in the vernacular of that country. If it's from Bangladesh, uh, he would be written in Bengali, it's from, from, uh, from um, China, written Chinese. And uh, here comes the problem. Uh, we all know that foreign workers as a whole uh, is an underpaid group of people. Uh, and generally, the, the market reality there is that most of them would be paid $600 to $800 basic for doing hard manual labor. Now, most of us would say that's already gross underpayment. Uh, um, However, um, over the years, I have looked at IPA that always shocked me, and I was asked, can this go any lower? So over the years, I have seen IPA that isn't 600 or 800, that's like 400, and, and then it just goes down. And uh, the last I have seen, the last IPA I have seen, which is the lowest in my record, is $220. And I'm sure in the weeks or months ahead, I probably will come across one that is below that. Um, so, so can you imagine coming to Singapore uh, with a salary written on a piece of official document saying that you'll be paid $220 a month? I mean, can you possibly live on that? Oh, um, however, however, no law is broken here. The employer who, is, who, who, who agrees with, who applied for that permit has written down that salary. It has a broken no Singapore law. So the Singapore Civil Service who issued it will also say that it's within our law to allow it because Singapore hasn't got a minimum wage law. So technically, you all can apply for a foreign worker if you have the quota given to you and just put five cents. And it will be legal. And if the worker comes here and he runs into a problem, you pay him five cents, he's not happy. Uh, it's your right to pay him five cents. And, and so the Singapore law has a recourse for a worker like that who is exploited? No, we don't. Now, if that worker is very unhappy and he feels so exploited, he really can't live on the amount. What should he do? But in other countries, he may just, out of sheer anger, protest, go and stand outside the MOM and so on. But our laws have increasingly been tightened to make that impossible. It would be illegal for him to protest. So therefore, our law on the one hand condones a uh, kind of setup that is exploitative and, of, and also obstruct people who want to try and do something to highlight their grievances. Uh, therefore, understand that the, the IPA system, which was crafted to, to make sure that uh, workers get the pay that they are promised, has got this great loophole in it because our laws are inadequate. We don't have a minimum wage law, therefore allowing legal exploitation. Now, let, let's say that uh, for a majority of IPAs issued in Singapore, uh, it's not that $220 situation, it's $600 to 800 Now, we all think that that really is underpayment, but actually, the foreign workers are okay with it. Uh, they kind of think that, yeah, with that, it's a better deal than if they were to be at home uh, jobless. They come here, they work all the overtime they can get, and they, they are satisfied or happy with what they're earning here. But the point here is that uh, here comes the second hurdle that happens sometimes. You get an IPA with a salary that you are happy with, uh, and the, the IPA you land in Singapore, only to find that your employer can then say, oh, uh, I, I really think I won't pay you uh, so much. It's a new contract. And the new contract comes with a new salary. Now, there's a term for this called contract, contract substitution. That really should not be the case. That, that by international law is... It's not right, it's illegal. Uh, how does this pan out in the Singapore governance issue? And this is where, in our work in TWC2, we find that the, the approach by our MF, MOM officials to this is highly discretionary. Uh, depending on which desk officer uh, is, is handling this complaint by a worker, uh, sometimes it's not allowed. 
But sometimes the worker is kind of told that it's too bad, you know, if you don't like the new contract, you shouldn't have signed it, kind of situation. So uh, I want to make a point here that in, in, in helping the, the workers that come to us, we find that Singapore law is sometimes adequate, uh, but uh, it is also, uh, it can be uh, quite inadequately enforced. There's a lack of transparency. And therefore, this is an ongoing issue for us with the Manpower Ministry uh, to try and sort these things out. <laughs> okay. Or you can start. Okay, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just add one more. Uh, uh, right. Um, for those who, who run into a situation like that, uh, a salary dispute, and they, and they come to us, and we find that uh, they have been grossly underpaid. Uh, but usually the experience is that that kind of underpayment doesn't, isn't just something that happened last month. It's not surprising to find that they have been underpaid for the past six months or the past one year even. So you can ask yourself, why, why did it take so long to surface the issue? And that's it. Um, um, the, the Singapore system is such is that there's, long, there's a, it's a lack of symmetry in power between employer and employee when it comes to the foreign worker. Uh, the foreign worker dare not complain because uh, his employer has the right to send him home without having got to give a, a proper reason. And the guy has paid lots of money to come here. Uh, usually borrowing or, or, or pawning land that he has for sometimes eight to ten thousand just get just, just get a job in Singapore. So for him, if he's here for for the first one year, he's basically working off that debt. So for him, it is critically important for him that he must stay on the job for as long as he can to to clear that debt and to earn some money. Um, so therefore, this guy therefore takes the kind of bullying that he has put up with for as long as he can. So the little bullying that he get, you know, underpayment maybe for uh, half a bun of salary, illegal deductions, uh, and things like that. He put up with it until he really cannot anymore, and then, and that's when that's when it becomes a case with MOM. What I'm saying is that for all the cases that you get lodged as a complaint with MOM, out there, out there among the foreign workers, there probably would be more cases that people don't have the, the courage or the confidence to bring up yet. Uh, this this brings uh, us to a, a question of just how many how many workers do have this kind of a problem. Um, I would ha happily agree with the civil servants who say we are only a minority of foreign workers have problems like that. Indeed, it should be a minority. If it is a majority, then my God, that there will be just one riot in India. There will be riots every day. But but let, let me let me give you put the let's put the figures in perspective and get a grip on what it means. Huh? One million foreign workers on low wage. All right. As a conservative estimate, let's say one percent of them meet with a rogue employer or a dishonest agent. One percent of one million is ten thousand workers. Ten thousand workers with a serious problem like that. In TWC two, we deal with two thousand a year. So another eight thousand is out there. <laughs> Maybe one of our sisters' organization deal with it. But yeah. So when you when you when you are told that oh, only a minority of foreign workers run into a problem like that, imagine uh, that this minority is not such a small number. It is an issue we really have to come to grips with. It is like, it is like drunk driving. You know, drunk driving also is a very small minority of drivers who drink, and, who drink. But it is really a serious problem. We have to devote resources to deal with. Uh, very quickly now, since I'm being pressed for time, uh, there are other issues that they face, like uh, work injury and, and, and employers dragging their feet and so on. Basically, again, it's the issue of the law. Some are not clear enough, and even if they are clear enough, uh, the manpower ministry can be quite lenient with employers who drag their feet. But let me just end up by just looking at the workers who don't complain, uh, the average worker out there who doesn't come to our notice. <coughs> Uh, is his experience in Singapore an unhappy one? And this I have to say that uh, I have to base it on the workers who come to us with their complaint, right? Um, and basically their unhappiness with Singapore is very, it's very focused on the problems they have with a employer, an agent uh, who cheated them, or a civil servant in MOM whom they feel is not helpful enough. 
Basically, we have never come across, or very seldom come across, a foreign worker who is who says that Singapore is a lousy place. They're actually quite happy here, uh, which which probably tells us that by and large, uh, Singaporeans do treat foreign workers okay, or at least uh, foreign workers are okay with us as a society. Once in a while, we have a community of people among us who don't show us at our best, like Serangoon Garden people who don't want a dormitory uh, in their neighborhood. But I would say that by and large, from what we can gather from the foreign workers uh, whom we help, their complaint is not with Singapore society or not at l with life in general in Singapore. It is all these specific issues of our inadequate laws and our bad enforcement of laws that cause them that problem and unhappiness. Thank you.